Greetings, welcome to our show, Ghosts Are Near, where we discuss and actively explore paranormal phenomena. I am your host, Keith Johnson, the co-founder of New England Anomalies Research, and of course, my wife, Sandra, is again in the control booth. Hello, Sandra, and uh, everyone's back there helping out, and we have a very, very distinguished guest today. I am so honored, uh, uh, a dear friend from many, many years ago, uh, Mr. Al Tyus, and he has written a book, Project Rabbit Hole. Uh, excellent book. It's a fascinating reading, and uh, let me give Al a little introduction here. Nice to have you with us, Al. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> we go way back. I think the last time you and I saw each other in person was at my father's funeral. And yeah. You were acting yeah, as a... 2006, yeah. It's been a, a while. You were a pallbearer there, and so that shows how far back we go. Exactly. With that. Exactly. But, uh, Al Tyus was born in Providence, Rhode Island. He earned a BA in history from Rhode Island College and an MA in military history from American Military University. His focus was Cold War nuclear studies. That's deep. As a paranormal investigator, he investigated over 100 public businesses, historical landmarks, and private homes within the DC metro area and beyond. He also appeared in various local newspapers, but usually as a token Halloween prop. Exactly. After realizing the reality of interacting with the supernatural and how it affected himself and others, he retired from investigating hauntings in 2006. He lives in Northern Virginia. Let's give a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Al Tyus. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, paranormal investigating, it's not all fun and games, as a lot of people tend to think. No, it's, it's, it's not, and for me it's kind of been a long journey because I was thinking about uh, when I first started this. It was in 99 mm -hmm. uh, when I first became interested, and I think I actually joined a group in the year 2000, and investigating back then was so different. We didn't have smartphones, we didn't have cameras in our phones. Most of us didn't even have cell phones. The internet was still pretty new. There was no social media. Right. And right things were so much different than uh, with equipment and with um, methods of investigating and everything. And it's one of the things I always find so interesting is that uh, I left this in 2006 and now in 2019 there has been no real progress with evidence or proof or anything like that into this mm -hmm. realm because paranormal investigators always say, you know, I'm, we're looking for proof. And one of the theses of my book is that you're not going to find the proof because we're exactly where we were, where the ancient Greeks were with this. Ah. Uh, we have no difference with it. They pondered it, questioned it. Uh, had some examples of it, that kind of stuff, and even though their philosophy was different with it, even in this advanced technological age, we don't think any differently with it. We know that they're still skeptics, they're still believers, and the evidence is still kind of sketchy and disputed, and there's also that part of it where a lot of people really don't know what they're doing, Yeah, and that's right. One of the big emphasis is that, that I put on this stuff is that um, we're not quite sure what we're, what we're doing now, but the only difference now is in every other society, they've always had people that were kind of a little bit more on the outskirts of things, and they were the ones that were very specially either trained or called to deal with the supernatural. While nowadays, anybody who can set up a website or um, basically set up a website and have a car and have some equipment, can call themselves a paranormal investigator with sure. no training sure. at all with it. And it's a whole new world on account of that. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I go over in Project Rabbit Hole is how the interest in paranormal investigating has evolved. Mm -hmm. And for me, starting out with the typical ghosts and hauntings and 
by the end of it realizing that there is an entire spectrum of things that go far beyond ghosts and hauntings mm -hmm. was oh, really yeah. the most compelling and uh, the most um, dangerous uh, part of all of this, yeah. which is why I, I won't go back into it again. There are inherent dangers that and a lot of people don't realize when exactly. they're getting into it. And it's not that I'm uh, um, afraid because, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm afraid of this, this kind of stuff at all, but I realize the dangers of it mm -hmm. and that's really what it what it come, boils down to with it. it's like you don't want to be you're not afraid of a pan of uh, may technically not be afraid of a pan of boiling water but you're not going to stick your hand in it either. right exactly you know, i guess exactly. that's how you, you kind of exactly. look at it now why the title project rabbit hole well when i was doing the research i was really trying to figure out uh, a good name for for the book and i kept thinking about the concept of a rabbit and the reason why I was thinking about a rabbit is because they're they're so elusive mm -hmm. is the big thing with it. Like they're impossible to catch. Yep. They always kind of stay one step ahead, and and then when they and then I was thinking about that whole concept of it, and they're very very hard to. Um, they're, they're kind of like you know hunt rabbits. It's kind of like a challenge mm -hmm. when it comes yep. to that, that kind of thing with it. And yet, people just think they're just so cute and alluring and, yeah, and that kind right. of stuff. And they just, they just, kind of like how people are with, with ghosts. It's like, oh, it's just, uh, just a little ghost like that. I'm going to go and like see what I can get with yeah, it and, right. and that kind of thing. And, and the second reason why was the whole Alice in Wonderland concept is as Alice went into Wonderland, it kind of got curiouser and curiouser and deeper and deeper. And as you, she was going further and further into Wonderland, things made less sense. Yes. And yet people still try to put their own knowledge into something that doesn't have the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. Mirror magic, yeah. That's true. And the big thing about this is that people use, um, try to use science to get evidence of these, I call them our elusive friends. Mm -hmm. That's my euphemism. Uh, they try to use science, and my argument is these things obviously don't fall under our knowledge, understanding of science. Therefore, mm -hmm. we really, in my opinion, we're not going to get the evidence that we're looking for based on what we know of science today. Right. Now, there might be something theoretical, whether it's quantum physics or unified string theory or something like that down the road or something that we just haven't discovered yet. But what we know now is still very, very rudimentary and very theoretical, and it's not going to work mm -hmm. with um, dealing with these beings. They're a lot smarter than us. Mm -hmm. They stay one step ahead of us yes. at all times. They, ins uh, they outsmart us. but. They also have a tendency, if you interact with the wrong one, they will attack. Yeah. And people don't realize that. And I once heard of a paranormal investigator saying, I want to be thrown across the room by something. <coughs> yes. Yeah. And I said to myself, yeah. it's not going to throw you across the room. You're going to come home and something's going to attach itself on you, mm -hmm. and it's probably going to throw your four-year-old across the room. Now, but, what do you think about yeah. that? Right. You know, and exactly. people don't, don't think about those kinds of things because in my experience, these, I have a whole section called hitchhiking entities. Mm -hmm. They latch on to somebody. Attachments, yeah. Usually a paranormal investigator because they're going into all different places all of yes. the time. Yes. They get something latched onto them. And obviously it's not a ghost because by definition a ghost isn't going to latch onto, it, onto you. They're confined to a particular area. Mm -hmm. And then they're in your home and now they're causing havoc in, in your home with this stuff. And so. What do you do? And I know a lot of people have left the field completely um, on account of that. And it yeah. just has been so um, <coughs> unnerving sure. for a long time. Sure, especially burned, yeah. And, and you yourself, of course, uh, we both go way, way back, way back. I mean, um, you, um, of course, we were both involved with TAPS and the TAPS family, yes. the Atlantic Paranormal Society. You, mm -hmm. um, you are the one who personally organized the original TAPS family reunion back in 2003, which took place in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and pre, pre Ghost Hunters. Yes, pre whole Ghost Hunters. And uh, back then, I think my group, uh, DC Metro Area Ghost Watchers, I think was the first or the second group in the TAPS family. 
So uh -huh. we were like yeah. kind of like the pioneers. And I served as a tax family manager for um, a, uh, on and off for brief periods of time as, as well to try to find uh, suitable groups that would be part of the TAPS family and, and that stuff too. And I got to know a lot of people all over the country that, that did this kind of work on account of that. And I can see who was on the ball with things and who were just kind of like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, and so, and, and, and I, I was kind of known for being, um, uh, you know, pretty tough with that. And I think a lot of people like really like disliked me for that, like, he didn't let us into the group, you know, kind right. of like that. I'm like, yep. Yeah. yeah it was, a lot of times it's just for, for your own good. You have, to, you have to kind of figure out what's going on here. Sure, sure. It. Now you talk about, um, in the book, a lot of uh, European history. You discuss ancient Greeks, of course, like that, but also European history. Mm -hmm. And um, you do uh, touch upon the, the Black Plague epidemic and how that um, really, really changed things and our perspective um, for humanity. I mean, humanity was at a point threatened of being wiped out. And also, as you mentioned, in Japan as well. People don't hear about that as often. No, no. Uh, the plague started in Asia and then it was carried over. Uh, I think it began in a port in Italy. Mm -hmm. And then it, from, from Italy, it just started to very gradually spread up and through um, different, different parts of Europe and some were, were hurt more than, um, more than others. And there were a couple of things I thought about with, with the Black Plague because I did a lot of research on it. And one is how people actually had really weird sightings before plagues. Mm -hmm. People actually yes. saw the yes. Grim Reaper. A man looked like a man dressed in a black, Some, a couple of times it was female, uh, but it was mostly male and it had a, a, like a black monk's hood on and it had a Sith or it had, sometimes it had like a broom or, or something like that. And um, other times they would actually see the face. It didn't look like a skeleton right. a lot of times. Grim and Reaper as we. The Grim Reaper as we know it. and they would see it, him or they would see an entourage of them. An entourage. Together, no, no, like that, six that or is, seven. That is disturbing. Yes, yes. Um, a lot of peasants' accounts have actually seen, like, oh, in a, a pasture, they would see, like, look like six or seven of them out there. And that was really uh, pretty uh, scary for, for them, mm -hmm. like that. And there was also these weird green mists that would come out, too, that um, heralded it. And, there were a lot of uh, things that happened. There were also stories of strange lights and mm -hmm. uh, various um, things like that. And, and of course, people back then thought it was the, it was the apocalypse. They yes, actually thought certainly. it was the final, the final days. The, the four horsemen were unleashed, and mm -hmm. that's really what it, was, what it was all about. And when you think about it, you and I are only here because our ancestors survived it. Yes. You know, and yes, so yes. that's really kind of kind of compelling to think about what our ancestors went through when one third of the whole continent was dying, mm -hmm. possibly even half in, in, in various places. Entire villages were wiped out with it. So it was um, an interesting time, and yet we don't hear about very many accounts of people haunting places now from the plague. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you don't hear like, oh, there's a plague ghost and there's a plague ghost there yeah, and right. that place. Because you think about with Europe, a lot of the buildings that are still standing, people died from plague in mm -hmm. those places. The streets, the buildings, everything. And yet, Europe is not infested with millions of, thousands of millions of, of plague right. ghosts. And it was so common. I mean, you know, uh, some children's nursery rhymes we have today have their origin in the plague because it was just bodies littering the street. It was so common. A ring around the rosy, you know, I mean. Exactly, incredible. exactly. And a lot of times when people, as soon as they um, got the first uh, signs that they were hit with the plague, they would um, commit suicide and just go right into the pit with the bodies yeah. and, and that stuff. I mean, you just think about how, how compelling that actually um, was on a regular basis. Life was basis. so short, so precarious. Exactly. And there were times like that, like, like in human history, we have what we kind of like call pitiful, pitiful, um, pivotal events yeah. that occur. And when once that happens, 
it changes the entire society. And that's an example of, another example of it is when we dropped a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And that changed the entire world as we, oh, as we yes. know it, including um, from a supernatural perspective mm -hmm. with it. Because that's really the first time we started really seeing flying saucers and visitations from aliens and those little gray guys and all that stuff all in mass mm -hmm. started really once we started um, experimenting with uh, nuclear bombs yes and that stuff so if you look at history we have those really pivotal moments that come up and it kind of like changes the entire flow of things and you see supernatural events that accompany them mm -hmm. What about uh, Saturn worship and that, how does that figure? Of course, we think of you know Saturnalia and um, Samhain, uh, which we know today as Halloween, which people consider a fun celebration without, I, I think generally without realizing the actual origin of well, this. Saturn's um, a controversial character uh, when, you, when you really look at the, um, the figure of Saturn because there are, um, uh, like kind of cults that are devoted to Saturn in various ways are Saturn um, element of, of entities, entities that kind of have like a Saturn, uh, Saturnine element to them. Uh, Saturn starts out as um, time. In fact, you even type in the Greek word for time, it comes up as Kronos. Mm -hmm. And Kronos was really the, 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 um, the god that swallowed up all of his children when they were born, yes. except for Zeus, who eventually overthrew him. And the, the Grim Reaper and Father Time are very much synonymous because you can't stop either of them. They're both right. completely, you know, you, you, you can't escape them, you can't stop them, you can't do anything. They just kind of keep on, keep on going. And in myth, at least, Cronus is uh, kind of chained up in Tatarus like that because um, when, with the war between gods, the, the Titans and the Olympians. But just because he's tied up in Tatarus doesn't mean people aren't still gonna, didn't still worship him because they did. Right. And that kind of uh, worship of that particular being still comes into nowadays with Saturnine-based um, cults. There was this uh, huge, um, ceremony when they opened up the Goddard Tunnel in Geneva. And I watched this very strange uh, ceremony that, 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 that people did. And as I was watching it, I started noticing that the entire procession was related to Saturn. They had people um, walking around with um, antlers on their heads, oh, yes, which yeah. is something that's kind of um, Saturn-based. Um, the god Cer Cerneos, mm -hmm. and they would put, actually put rings on his um, antlers. Uh, people were dressed up as haystacks. They were um, somebody dressed up as a baby was flying around. <laughs> and Saturn is also associated with um, babies because Cronus ate his children. And all these elements, and so I'm sitting there watching this for the first time, and I started predicting things that were gonna start coming out in it. And I said, if they show a giant clock, then you know it's gonna be Saturn. And lo right. and behold, there's this giant clock. And all the colors they use were black, white, and red, which are also uh -huh. very much um, Saturn-based colors. And I just kept watching this, this whole thing with these weird processions people were doing and um, suspending themselves up in the ear on rings, like as a suspension of time and, and all these different things. I just said, this is just a really elaborate ritual to Saturn. Now, a lot of people look, watch that and they said it's automatically, they were like, it's a ritual to Satan. And, and I just was mm -hmm. like, well, you can say that, but I don't take everything and say, oh, that's satanic, that's satanic. I want to look at the bigger picture of all this and mm -hmm. see where it's coming from. And I saw that as a, um, a big time ritual for Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that's becoming more and more prevalent is the um, Santa Muerte in Latin America, oh, which is yes. a, um, called, she's called Saint Death. It's a, a female um, image of the Grim Reaper and she wears uh, long dresses and she's a skeleton and mm -hmm. and that and uh, she is extremely popular in Latin America mm -hmm. and a lot of the people that started with worshiping her and it's true worship they started worshiping her because they were considered undesirables for the Catholic Church mm -hmm. yeah. and right. uh, people like drug addicts and prostitutes and people that um, 
uh, prisoners, uh, ex-cons, people like that, uh, that were kind of seen as ostracized, they would all go to Santa Muerte and start building altars to her and yeah. give devotions to her and all this stuff. And they say every time, they say, she gives us what we want. Mm -hmm. She actually gives us what we want. And you say like, well, is she a Catholic saint? No, she's a goddess. Mm -hmm. And she actually has a very long, elaborate name from and, um, the Aztec culture that I'm not going to even mention because it's just so long. I can never get the <laughs> South, the, the, the Aztec names of the gods, but um, she comes directly from that. And if you look at the way she's portrayed now, uh, she's replacing the Virgin Mary. Uh, they used to have like the Mary in front of the Guadalupe, mm -hmm. um, which is like this kind of an oval shape and Mary stands in the middle of it and now you don't see Mary in it you actually see Santa Muerte in it and now um, a lot of um, altars now that originally were set up for the Virgin Mary now the Virgin Mary is gone and Santa Muerte is there and so you can see the um, but people replacement. a lot of times don't realize the difference correct they don't realize the difference with it and they don't quite understand it and a lot of times people think of it as just um, they see it either as voodoo or they see it as just some sort of a, um, if they're not Catholic, they just see it, oh, it's just another Catholic saint, and yeah, they right, kind of leave it right. at that, but they don't realize that uh, Santa you, are, Muerte, you yourself are an authority on voodoo and, and the I life. try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're I extremely, extremely knowledgeable. Yeah, and, uh, and this falls under, um, this kind of falls under that, but voodoo doesn't really have gods. They have loas, which are kind of like ancestral spirits that, mm -hmm. uh, or these, um, the Loas were actually alive at one time. Mm -hmm. And then the people who uh, work with them would still give devotions to them. A lot of times they're family spirits and they would, they would invoke them for various uh, things. I talk about that a lot in um, Project Rabbit Hole about how um, if you wanted to communicate with the spirits, you have to invoke Papa Legba to open up the gates, and then uh -huh. the other ones come through, but you have to get permission from Legba before that happens. Mm -hmm. With Santa Morta, it's more of like a direct relationship with her that doesn't involve anything with Christianity, or less and less with Christianity. And now you see like a lot of people are getting like the Santa Morta tattoos. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, neighborhoods are developing altars to Santa Morta. A lot of times if you go into like botanicas, there'll be altar to the skeleton dressed up like a bride. Yes, um, yes. And that's the um, so that's, that's, the Santa uh, Morta. It's getting more and more common. And you know, with all these like paraphernalia down below the altar, which are like the offerings, money, sometimes it's cigarettes, sometimes mm -hmm. it's other things. Mm -hmm. And th they have all these um, things that come up with it. And as um, Latin American immigration keeps coming up through um, through uh, the United States, there's more and more of an increase mm -hmm. with seeing the Santa Morte. Wow. From what I understand that um, a practitioner or a follower can sometimes choose to marry their loa. Yes. Spirit. Yes, they, they, they can do that, and that's, that's kind of interesting. They can choose to marry their loa, and uh, they can be married to a um, regular person, but the night of, they have one night that's devoted to the loa, which means that there's no intimacy between the spouse during that night. So if it's like, if you marry to a loa and you ch choose Wednesday night to be the night for the loa, that's the night for the person to have their night with the loa. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no intimacy involved in their spouse, with their spouse at all, any Wednesday night. Yeah. So like that, if they choose that, that day. And a lot of times they have dreams about being with the loa that night. Really? The, the loa will actually come to their, into their dreams and they have very intimate dreams involving the, the loa. Mm -hmm. which is their other spouse. Right. Wow, so. that's, that's, uh, that's very interesting and uh, kind of disturbing in a way, at least I it, think It so. really, it, it, kind of, it kind of is because um, the loa also have like a, a negative aspect to them too. Yeah, and there was, the, of course, the concentration in New Orleans is what you write about, cover that very, very well. New Orleans is a very fun city but it's a very dark city yeah you know I, I spend a lot of time um, down in Louisiana mm -hmm. and I say like you know being part French Canadian I always feel like the Cajuns are kind of my distant cousins and mm -hmm. so I like I like going down there um, and 
The last time I was down there, I went into one tourist place, and I talk about this in the book, and I felt like three things just jumped right on top of me and were like almost like kind of like overwhelming. I couldn't yeah. breathe or anything like that, and I just kind of went, oh, no, not this again, <laughs> you know? And, and the biggest thing about, about hauntings, if you're talking about hauntings in general, is they like to catch you off guard. Yes. That's why when the paranormal investigators go into these places looking for activity, they rarely find it. And they spend three hours in the basement just waiting for something to happen. It doesn't happen. But if they're setting things up or after they leave or something like that, that's when it starts up. Yeah, it doesn't mean they're not being watched. And here's a, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but a picture of Santa Morte there. The bride, the skeleton dressed as a bride. And of course, the uh, popular uh, frog goddess there. That is actually the god um, Heck, uh, Keck. Uh -huh. And there's an interesting no, no section. No relation, no relation. Yeah, there's <laughs> an interesting section on, on I'm not going to get into it uh, today, but there's an interesting section on how the new devotion to this ancient Egyptian frog god has influenced the 2016 election. Wow. And there's a whole write-up that I, I do with that and how entities now, very powerful entities, are influencing through the internet. Mm -hmm. Now that can actually sound a little crazy, but when you think about it, even like with EVP coming in through the airwaves or something like that, Certainly. how can something not come in and influence through, um, through the internet? Certainly, we, we, we've experienced that. So you uh, do have a book signing this evening. This evening I'm having a book signing between yeah. 6 and um, 8 um, over at the um, Panera Bread over on Chapel Hill Road mm -hmm. uh, with that. And so that's, that's going to be kind of fun yeah. with that. And if somebody is interested in your book, Project Rabbit Hole, and wants to contact you for your uh, vast uh, knowledge and wisdom, uh, how would they contact you? The um, best bet would be to send me a message through... Um, Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Um, I have um, email, and there is uh, my email is um, located. I think it's located in the book, and if it's not, it's on the web. My author website, mm -hmm. and that I, I have an author website um, under uh, my publishing page, lulu.com slash a tyus and i'm also on amazon i have an author page on there too um and you could just put me up through a search engine and you'll you'll um you'll find it there are only two altiuses in the world there's me and there's one in australia so it's really? not that wow. difficult to, <laughs> and we kind of and the guy from australia looks a lot like my father did it's really kind of interesting yeah, but synchronicity. Um, yeah synchronicity but uh you can go on there and uh you can find it and um and, and, and check it out and let me know what you think about it. It's not the typical book about paranormal no, investigating. No, indeed. It's very, this very is, deep. This is about other things that you may encounter if you are um, investigating. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just want to warn you about that. It gets very, very deep. I have a lot of um, uh, footnotes and um, literature to back up my claims. Yes, and I also do. go over a lot of my personal experiences as well and why I chose to leave this field. I understand totally and very, very worth it getting into this. It goes very, very deep and expla explanations and a lot of warnings too from somebody who has this experience. Well, Al, thank you so much for visiting us and it's great for having me here and we'll have to have you on again. Please, Absolutely. please come back, you know. I'd be so happy So glad to. you make the trip and everything. Maybe we'll come to you next time, maybe. Sounds great. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Al, and uh, God bless everyone. Thank you, Al Tyus. Thank you.